All right, we've got a few people. I hate this title. <laughs> it's an awful title. You know, and I got the I got the seminar flyer and I looked at it and I'm like, who wrote this title? <laughs> because if I, you know, the, any students that I've had in my lab, I would never let them have this kind of title or I would never advise this kind of title. And then I, I realized, oh, how did that happen? And I realized, oh yeah, this was the other night when I realized that this was due like a week ago and then I forgot about it. And then at like whatever, late at night I was doing this. And then I started looking at the abstract and realized, oh, that was a mess too with all kinds of typos and all of that. So, so this was actually a great opportunity for me though to remember something. Um, and I've got a lot of mind hacks that I like to use, but one of them is this, and I thought I'd share it with you guys, which is a mistake is not something which is wrong, but it's an opportunity. And so this particular mistake, you know, of like not really paying attention when I was writing a title and making it three lines long, which is like even too long for a, a paper, right? Well, it was a great opportunity because it got me to give myself a chance to revise that title. So I'm going to revise that title and show you the revised title, which looks something like this, which um, I was going to come up with a second phrase, but then I thought maybe pictures are better. Actually, so to word real-time personalized medicine, that is what we'll be talking about, and using wearable sensors, that's totally what we'll be talking about. Um, but then I have these two images here, and it gives me a chance to actually share with you what these mean to me. And I'm going to spend a fair amount of time, well, a fair amount, not don't worry, it won't be the whole hour, but, but a bit of time talking about this curve, this S-shaped sigmoid curve. And then, so that's at one end. And at the other end, I have this picture here, ultimately to represent health. And so as you know, was mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist and I definitely see patients who have you know, very advanced disease, but ultimately what we're trying to do, right, is, is, to, is to reach something called health. And there's many ways to define it, but I feel like this picture defines it pretty well in terms of you know, the feeling and the, the uh, imagery actually that, that you get with this. So anyways, that, that's what I'll talk about today. So I don't have any conflicts to disclose uh, related to this talk, and I'll give you a quick uh, outline, right? Background, I'll spend some time just telling you a little bit more about the background, about the inspiration, the motivation for like why, why I'm very passionate about wearable sensors and, and where this field can go. And then I'll talk a bit about a very focused study about temperature data and using that as a, as a biomarker. And in fact, you know, this was a very, very close collaboration with, with two other groups. One is Sung Choi's group. She's a pediatric uh, oncologist. And the other is Danny Forger's group. And so Danny, I'm so happy that, you know, Danny actually is, is here because there may be some questions that, that, that come up that Danny might also be able to answer that are, you know, more on the mathematical side. And Dave Wook also from his team, wonderful. And so I'll talk about that. And then just, I'll take just a minute, basically, to just talk about some future directions, you know, from my perspective. So let's start with background. And, you know, I mentioned that S-shaped curve. And I have to say, I totally geek out on that curve. And even I was telling my wife the other day, I'm like, I'm totally going to geek out on this because I geek out on it every time because I have been just like, I don't know, like just captured by this since when I was an undergrad and I took my first biochemistry class and I saw this and, you know, this is the hemoglobin dissociation curve, I think related to what the concentration of oxygen is and at low concentrations of oxygen, you know, hemoglobin sticks tightly and then, you know, at higher concentration that doesn't stick as tightly. And I thought this was interesting. And it's the first time I'd actually even heard the, probably heard the word sigmoid. I didn't even know what it meant. And I kept talking about the sigmoid curve. And then over the years, right, going through grad school, doing all the, you know, molecular biology, cell and molecular biology courses, going through medical school, you know, doing all the human physiology and all of that, I, I found that this curve pops up everywhere, right? So um, you can see here, here's the DNA melting curve, right? If you have two strands of DNA, you heat them. And, you know, what percentage of the DNA is going to be un, un, uh, annealed versus annealed? very similar. Here's the influenza spread curve. I'm sure the COVID spread curve is very similar. Here's a bacterial growth curve. And here's even a, a curve from social psychology on the transmission of behaviors, how behaviors spread, you know, within a community. 
And to me, this was actually has been very fascinating since I was a postdoc. Because as a postdoc, I started out in a lab that was doing functional genomics. And by the time five years later, you know, we, we finished, it was, uh, I finished, I mean, it's the words had changed, but it was really into systems biology. And in my last year or two as a postdoc, I sort of felt like a lot of the functional genomics we were doing were systems biology, as we called it. It wasn't really, it wasn't what I had, what I had promised or, you know, what I had envisioned, which is I thought that. Um, you know, if we could just get enough data and we could just measure every parameter in a cell or even in a, in a, in a system, you know, like that, we would be able to eventually like, you know, do some calculations and, and, and basically predict everything that's going to happen. And boy, was I in for a rude surprise. That was my first one of many, many, you know, episodes of naivete, I would say in my life. And, but one of the things that was great about it is that it, it got me to kind of dig into that. So I started like asking the question of like, how much do we know and how much can we know and, and what is modeling all about? And, and I never became a modeler, so I'm not a card carrying you know, modeler by any means, but I, I went and had conversations. I took some courses and did all of that. And one of the things that came out of that though was trying to understand, um, and it wasn't just from modeling, but, but from like going into complex system science, you know, a bit was trying to understand why these S-shaped curves exist. Like what's the underlying basis of that? And it really turns out as far as I can tell, and, you know, you know, maybe there, there could be other um, views on this, but in my view, most of these sigmoidal curves, most of the time, they're the result of allosteri. And allosteri is kind of a jargon term for me and from biochemistry. Um, but I think basically what it means is anytime you have a network of connected things, if what's happening on, for example, the classic example is in a protein molecule, if what's happening over here can influence what's happening over here, or if it's over time steps, what happened before influences what's next, you get this nonlinear behavior and ultimately you can get, sometimes you can get these sigmoidal curves. And so that was really, you know, interesting to me. And then the other interesting thing, of course, is that this sigmoidal curve in the middle there, right? Um, in biology really describes state transitions. So, you know, like for example, here in the DNA melting curve, it goes from two strands bound together to two strands, you know, floating apart. Um, from bacterial growth, you know, you could kind of look at it as from a, a very like non-communal state of bacteria, you know, and then they grow. And then now you've got this like very dense community, you know, similar sort of yeah, uh, interpretations exist, you know, for all of these curves. And so, after kind of going through medical school and then residency and clinical fellowship training, from my perspective, these state transitions seem to be like so relevant for medicine because we don't talk about it, I'll tell you, in medicine. I'll give you like, you know, the medicine window, hopefully, a little bit. Um, people don't talk about state transitions, but this is exactly what's happening, right? You're transitioning from a healthy state to a disease state. This is a very, very you know, gross simplification. But then the question is like, how does that all happen? And, you know, everything I'm, I'm actually going to say here today, almost everything except the part that Danny's lab worked on is actually really super simple. There's nothing like really complex about it in a way um, or, or abstruse about it. But it's just that for me personally, I just, you know, get very, um, I don't even know what the right word is, but like I keep asking myself, how come we're still practicing medicine without these ideas? They're simple ideas, but actually coming into the, the healthcare field, coming into the medical field. And so one of the things you know, that's related to this, again, comes back to this S-shaped curve. And I'm going to show you this plot. And actually, um, uh, this is a kind of a perspective piece that, that Song Choi um, and uh, with Jonathan Tyler, who was a postdoc in Danny's um, lab, we wrote together. And it really does talk about this, this basically the same S-shaped curve. And the idea here is that if you just, again, abstract out a little bit about disease, time is on this axis, on the X-axis, on the Y-axis is, is basically, you know, what's the evidence of that disease? It could be a biomarker that you're measuring, or it could be symptoms, it could be you know, whatever you define, right, as the definition of a disease state. And 
the thing is that um, from this model, and I think there's quite a bit of data actually from real disease that would support at least that this is a very common model. And again, this is how complex living systems seem to work, at least from, from my perspective. So this is our working model. You know, there's this pre-disease state that lasts for a while. And then you have over here, this disease state. And then in between something happens. And the early pre-disease state is ideally, it'd be great if you'd know what's gonna happen back here. But as you can see, the signal is pretty low. So signal to noise is low. Then over here on the far right is the disease state. Here, the signal to noise, you know, actually is quite good compared to baseline, right? But the problem is, is out here is typically when you have symptoms, <laughs> you know? And so by this time, you know, a person can be actually pretty sick. And I started out like thinking about this when we were doing those circulating nucleic acid biomarkers, because we were really interested in early cancer detection. And this was the problem that we ran into is, well, by the time there's an established cancer and there's enough DNA or other biomarkers released into the bloodstream, it's all very established. But when you start really early out, there's just traces of those and they're really hard to find. And so the trick is actually that there's this window, right? That's the transition state. That's the actual evolution of the disease process. And how can we get a window into that? Um, you know, has been really the, the, the question because this is the place where you have a chance, uh, I think a fighting chance, so to speak, of actually detecting something that's happening and then, um, but also detecting it early enough, right? Where, where an intervention could actually re reverse the process. So again, none of this is again, like, you know, super high <laughs> intellectually, um, but I think it's important. And, and the thing is, and again, I'm gonna talk to you now again with the medical lens, the healthcare lens kind of you know, having one foot, you know, in that, in that world. This to me is, is like the elephant, right? The elephant in the room, as they say. Everyone always ignore me. <laughs> and and I, I don't mean to um, ha have any disrespect to actually a lot of people who are not ignoring this, at least in the research world. There's a lot of people who are very passionate, right? About early prediction and, and prevention and intervention and all of that. Uh, when I say this, I just mean that that's not in my view the predominant state of healthcare. And so this first part, again, was more about inspiration and motivation. And I'll tell you, um, here's a book that uh, I, I studied this version of, of a version of this book like 20 years ago now. This is basically an internal medicine manual. And the title I noticed has not changed. You know, and this was like around the year two, probably 1999. I was studying for my boards or whatever, right? Um, it was still called Current Medical Diagnosis and Treatment. <laughs> and today it's still called Current Medical Diagnosis and Treatment. It's just the year has changed, right? And the thing is, you know, this medicine is about this. It's over here, right? Current Medical Diagnosis and Treatment. And so, you know, the future would be universal prediction and prevention, right? I mean, that's, that's, Anyways, I mean, I, I know I, I spent you know quite a bit of your time uh, talking about this, but I, I I I just felt it was important that that that's to me the the motivation for a lot of what goes on in this field. And again, there are lots of people that are interested in this. Uh, it's not, and actually, I'm very excited that there's more and more people interested in this, in basically moving from a reactive system for healthcare, which is mostly driven by symptoms. I mean, yes, we have screenings for certain cancers and some of that, but it's still like, it's still a tip of the iceberg, I believe of what's possible. But this, this shift, um, I think is, 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 you know, that, that's what's inspiring to me. And so I hope that one day, <laughs> this title of this book will be changed from current medical diagnosis and treatment to current medical prediction, prevention and diagnosis and treatment. I don't know what year that will be, but I actually hope that some of you guys that are working in this room right now will you know, but we'll be the ones to help contribute to that. Um, okay, I mean, any questions actually just about that background stuff? I'll just pause for a, for a minute. Yeah, can you hear me, Manish? Yes. Thank, that thank you, I, I would love that. You know, I've been thinking the same thing about this transition point in the case of depression with treatment resistant depression. There was a, um, talk that was given a uh, for the Eisenberg uh, Award for depression at the kickoff for the, uh, the renaming of the Depression Center. 
-hmm. you know, and it looks like it, when one hits treatment resistance and depression, which means that you had multiple failures of drugs, you're yeah. actually in a state where the brain is like broken in some ways and the drugs can't affect the brain. They would a normal brain. Yeah. And so actually when they intervene and get the person out of major depression, depression through implantable, you know, stimulation or T yeah. uh, cranial or ketamine or psilocybin, then the brain starts is available to heal again. So there's this area where there's this, you know, you have that red line, it's like nonlinear, but then it's highly nonlinear, then it's kind of nonlinear, but kind of behaved a little bit. And I think in yeah. that zone, if we could model that, we might really do ourselves a favor in terms of our understanding of, you know, the onset of disease. And I really appreciate you this talk. I won't take up any more of your time. Oh, thank you, Brian. I, I wasn't aware that, you know, there's a similar thing going on in psychiatry, though I'm not surprised, you know, because because I said in the beginning, it's like, I, I've actually challenged people to find me a, a place in biology where there isn't some of this, you know, going on. And I, I have yet to see anyone who's who's found that, you know, that where where the curve is really not linear, uh, uh, sorry, is, is really linear and not uh, not uh, sigmoidal, in, at least in some component of it. So, uh, and you know, we run into the same thing in oncology, Brian, which is that once tumors are established, it's almost like, you know, you, you, know, you know, this concept of course, right? I mean, of like attractor states. And it's almost like once you land in that attractor state, exactly. and now in that place, and now to pop it out, you have to do something really intense, right? Like exactly, and you know, diabetes uh, to you know, metabolic the whole metabolic syndrome thing and progression pre-diabetes. It's a strange attractor, and then to be able to get out of that, and that's exactly how they modeled the treatment resistance in the talk that Helen Mayberg gave for uh, yeah. winning the award. They knew had a picture of the attractor, and she was working with physicists. Yeah. Same well, that's thing. Super, that's super interesting. And, and again, like for as motivation, if it is for anyone, you know, in this room in general, who's, who's interested in this field, I mean, that's the whole idea, right? Is if, if through the work that you do, we can do this kind of prediction, like it doesn't have to get to where a disease has become a whole, you know, new attractor state. And now you got to take like, you know, massive, essentially, um, interventions with lots of side effects, right, to actually pop it out of there. So um, I'm going to sort of switch over a little bit now and talk to. Oh yeah, sure. No, please. Question yeah. Do they cover like a standard format of disease every every year, or do they change the? Oh, the, this this particular book you're talking about. Do they cover like a standard set of areas of of medicine or? Do they vary with with each issue? Oh no, this is uh, it's it's internal medicine. So there's a scope that's covered in internal medicine, which is pretty broad. So mm -hmm. it's essentially the same topics every year. Okay. And you know, so to be fair, like a snapshot. To, uh, pardon me. It's sort of like a snapshot. Yeah, it's sort of a snapshot yeah. exactly of like diabetes. What's the current diagnosis mm -hmm. and treatment? And you know, on, in whatever lung cancer, what's the current diagnosis and treatment? In nephrology, you know, the whole the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The things that aren't covered are like you know, surgery, obstetrics, psychiatry. Those things are not covered as much, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and to be fair, there is a prevention chapter in there, but you know, it's like one out of, you know, a very small fraction. And, and and it's not, again, it's no knock on the people writing these books. It's just that's that's kind of where we're at right now. And and so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I worked on these circulating nucleic acids. And one of the reasons to work on these new circulating nucleic acids was I felt like, okay we can get blood samples and we could get them over time and maybe we can get information right on this kind of dynamics. And so we started doing that, but then, you know, that has its own inherent limitations in terms of at least time. You can get a whole different kind of information, right? With sequencing and, and you know, all kinds of uh, proteomics and metabolomics. That's what we're doing in our multi-omic study of cytokine release syndrome, but getting really fine time resolution is one of the limitations. And so we still continue to work on this. And one of the things we've been working on is, is trying to get these biomarkers instead of out of the blood, out of the urine, because a lot of markers that are in the blood actually get into the urine. Um, that, and so that's, that's another project you know, that, that we're working on because that would allow us to get, again, more, more time resolution. But what was really exciting to me, probably about, it's probably about 10 years ago, you know, was of course, all of these wearable technologies that started coming out 
Um, and this is when I was at Fred Hutch and, and, um, and moving here, part of the actual motivation of, to move here was to be, so see, Fred Hutch is a dedicated cancer center. It's not a university. I was affiliated with the University of Washington, but it's different when you have DCMB and the hospital, you know, and the math department, you know, and the engineering school and the sociology school and everybody under one roof, you know, all were under one president. It's, it's, it's different, you know, in terms of, I'd say the, the, the culture, the environment and, and what you can get done. And that was one of the reasons to, to move here. And so what became really exciting, of course, was this idea of digital biomarkers, right? So you could get data. Of course, you get different kinds of data. We can't get necessarily, you know, gene expression data or single cell genomics data on this time scale, but we can get, um, you know, some data, you know, that that's more like a composite. It's sort of a difference in scale, right? Like we've, again, we do work that's at the molecular and cellular scale, but now with these wearable devices, you're kind of getting at a higher level of scale. I, I don't want to say it's the whole system, but it's sort of looking at the whole system and, 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 and looking at sort of windows into it. And as you might be aware, I mean, there's all kinds of devices, um, at least consumer grade, there's a lot of devices. Now there's also medical grade devices that are coming out. And even like this was before the pandemic, like three, four years ago, I went to a wearable devices uh, summit and um, I was amazed by companies like Bosch. You know, I thought they just made dishwashers, but they have a whole R&D section devoted to smart textiles. So they're looking into the future about like clothing and getting wearables implanted in there. So, so I think that, you know, there, there are lots of opportunities that are going to be there that are already there in terms of be able to capture this kind of data. And so, you know, what we've again been excited about is the idea that this cause, this can provide this sort of personalized medicine in a different way, which I mean, different way than, like I said, the other projects that we do, right? That might be, for example, related to multi-omics. In this case, the personalization is based upon you know, getting this physiological data of what's happening um, to the body over time. And because they're wearable sensors and wirelessly connected, it can be real time. And then of course, you know, the real exciting part would be the predictive modeling piece. And so um, I'll sort of transition there. So this is what got us into these wearable devices. And now what I'm gonna do is talk to you about like one case study, essentially. There's different ways to look at it, right? Like one question we asked, one case study, one like narrowed down, here's a project, right? Um, and in this particular case, there's, as you probably, as you know, I mean, with wearables, there's so many different threads of data you can get. You can get heart rate, like even with this Fitbit that I'm wearing, you get heart rate, accelerometry, um, sleep, you know, all, the, all this kind of stuff. Um, but the one that, and, 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 you know, with our collaborators, we're looking at those other data types as well. But one of the data types that has been uh, probably less, available from the consumer wearables, although it's changing now, is temperature. And in this case, I mean body temperature. And um, so we got interested in looking at, you know, what are the dynamics of body temperature and what can they tell us about disease, especially hopefully in this pre-diagnosis state. And temperature, as you may already know, is very fundamental. Like we just look in the universe, right? It's a fundamental property of the universe. And it's also a fundamental influence on living systems. So over here on the left side here is from, you know, from my physical chemistry undergrad class, you know, the Gibbs free energy equation and temperature is there. There's a lot of other terms that are not there, you know, that we study, but temperature is there. And then over here are enzyme kinetics and activation energies, right? Or even chemical reaction kinetics, right? And how temperature influences all of that, right? So so that was one of the motivations to, to actually, you know, look into temperature. The other interesting thing about temperature from a human physiology standpoint is it's so tied to the immune system and inflammation and infection. And this is kind of, again, kind of busy diagram here, but what I'm, the reason I put it up here is to kind of illustrate that what's actually happening with your body temperature, it's normally very, very tightly regulated, right? Um, but and the, there's a whole system essentially, and there's a system that, that takes inputs. And obviously there's a system that takes those outputs like the sweat glands and your mobility and all of that to maintain this temperature and, and tight regulation. But what's interesting then is that actually when your temperature 
goes out of regulation, it's usually a, a big deal. Now, from a hospital standpoint, okay, maybe it's not a big deal. You ask a lot of doctors and they'll say, oh, if your temperature is 99.9, .9, oh, you're fine, right? I mean, this is normal and it's okay. It's okay because again, like I have to put like different hats on, right? So sometimes when I put the hats or the doctor glasses, you know, I would say like my parents will call my temperature is 99.9. .9. Don't worry, it's fine, it's fine, right? Because I don't want them to be stressed or whatever, and we'll watch, and nothing we can do. But then if you put this other hat on of physiology and, and research and science, you say, well, 99.9, .9, that's probably not really normal, you know? It may not be disease yet, but there, there's, there's something that could be off, depending on what all else is going on. And so the, what, what, what I, what's sort of il illustrated here is that Anytime there's infection or inflammation uh, or certain, certain types of inflammation, they activate the innate immune system. And it actually, these cells in the innate immune system secrete these cytokines, these proteins that go through the blood. And they are called pyrogenic cytokines They're because they cause fever. And these cytokines then actually end up in the brain and end up in the blood vessels to the hypothalamus in the endothelial cells. They have effects there. And all of this stuff, right, is happening. And then that actually triggers the hypothalamus to decide where your temperature set point is and whether you should have fever or not. So it's this like very sophisticated, very sophisticated process, right, to regulate this global parameter of temperature. And so, you know, the way we're thinking about it is, wow, like, you know, like people are trying to come up with biomarkers or we're trying to make machines to figure out what's going on, right? sensors, but the body's already doing it. You know, it's got this very sophisticated system. So if we can just measure some deviations in this, you know, it, it's probably going to be meaningful. So that, that's the, that's the backdrop for all of this. And then, you know, as a, as a scientist, right, looking now in patient populations, we have to decide where do you start? And so if you're going to, usually with, with, with research, at least what I've seen is you try to look for the extremes, at least starting out, right? Whether in genetics, like when early days of genetics, people look for those Mendelian traits that were like really highly penetrant. You start looking at the extremes and then go from there. So for temperature, a couple of sort of the extreme cases are, are really when you have patients who don't have a strong immune system for fighting infection, for example, you know, or you have other patients who, um, get, you know, syndromes where, uh, where the immune system is just taking off and just exploding. And when I say they don't have a strong immune system for, for fighting infection, that doesn't mean they don't have the immune system for sensing infection. So there's two patient populations we decided to study. One are the ones that get stem cell transplants, and the others are these patients who get this therapy called chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy or CAR T-cell therapy and a lot of mumbo jumbo, but the bottom line is these are basically patients that get treatments that we call cellular therapy because basically you take the cells, you take immune cells out of the patients, you do something to them. And then uh, in one case, you do something with the CAR T cell therapy, you modify them. In the other case, you treat the, treat the patient with a lot of chemotherapy to try to kill their cancer and you infuse them back in. But in both of these cases, these patients are really uh, susceptible to severe infections. I mean, to the point where like, you know, they can die from those infections very quickly in 24, 48 hours. Um, that's the case for the stem cell transplant patients. And for these CAR T cell therapy patients, they get something called cytokine release syndrome, where the immune cell, because you take their T cells, you take their immune cells, you expand them, and then you just pump them back in and they get into the body and then they take off trying to fight the cancer but sometimes, and actually very commonly, that whole process really sets off, triggers a whole cascade. And, and the reason I'm telling you all this is in both of these cases, the first signal that there's a serious infection or that um, the cytokine release syndrome is happening is fever. And, and so that was a long explanation to give you the background. <laughs> But I, you know, at least I, I hope, I hope it's, it's, it's helpful to at least get the context of this. And so that's why we decided to work, actually focus on these two populations of patients, because we thought that, you know, this is a case where if there's going to be a temperature dysregulation, it's going to be big. And 
also, if we can find a way to pick it up earlier, it's going to have a big impact because these are both very serious uh, complications that can send patients to the ICU, potentially lethal. Um, so I think, yeah, we talked pretty much about this. So, and so we had a couple of, again, these are the two populations. And, you know, our hypotheses, you know, basically were that, um, let's see where it's at. Okay. Uh, our hypothesis was basically, can we, if we were to now get continuous temperature data, because these patients are actually in the hospital, they check into the hospital, they get their treatments, they're observed for anywhere from two to four weeks, and then they're discharged. And during that time, all kinds of crazy stuff can happen, like these life-threatening, you know, serious infections, or this cytokine release syndrome. And so our basic hypothesis was that if you look right now at the standard of care, it's nurses coming in, taking temperature every four to eight hours. That's what's normally done. And if we could actually now do a continuous temperature monitoring where we're getting the data in the case of what we did was every two minutes, you know, could that number one, allow us to just pick up fever sooner? And could it number two, allow for prediction? you know, of, of, the, of the events even before they happen. And I'm gonna briefly just talk to you about fever. <laughs> so fever has been known for, I know at least a thousand years, there's historical records or at least of, of fever uh, or the idea that, you know, when people get sick, their body gets hot. I'm sure it's many more than that a thousand years. It's probably, you know, very, very back into our history. But when it comes to medical sort of definitions of fever, the generally accepted medical definition is above 38 degrees Celsius is fever and below it's no fever. And this threshold was actually established like over like, you know, like over hundred years ago, 150 or whatever years ago. And it was actually by this guy who like actually did a clinical study. I don't know how he did it, but you know, I guess research was, was a little, clinical research was a little faster back then or whatever, but he studied 25,000 patients and then came up with this threshold and it's more or less still used. Even though we all know that people vary, right? So even though body temperature is very tightly regulated from person to person where their set point is could be different, you know, due to thyroid hormone status, for example, and also throughout the day, which we'll talk about shortly, you know, with circadian variation. But in the hospital right now, I'll tell you, it's just simple, 38 degrees, that's what it is. And, and there's reasons for that, you know, and I think one of the reasons is we haven't had this kind of technology, so we don't even know if it would make a difference. And the other is cognitive overload, because there's so many things uh, physicians have to like know and make these choices and decisions and and so that's where, again, a lot of the work, at least more broadly, right, being done in DCMB and in the, these allied fields, you know, towards reducing some of that with decision support, et cetera, I think it's just going to be so important. So um, as I mentioned, hypothesis was that hopefully we can detect these fevers and these events earlier because the fever is essentially the defining signal, you know, that says there's an infection or there's cytokine release syndrome, and then hopefully predict it as well. And this is just a rough, you know, overview of the study. You know, it was, it had about 60 odd patients in it. And about, you know, two thirds of these 43 were these stem cell transplant patients and about, you know, 25 were these CAR T cell therapy patients. And what we used was uh, actually an FDA approved uh, dedicated temperature monitoring device. It's a little skin patch. And it was actually originally developed for babies so that, you know, parents could just, you know, put this patch on their little infant and not have to go and disturb the infant because, you know, ne never, never wake up a sleeping baby, just like, you know, that, that's like a rule of, of parenting. <laughs> and so, um, and, and so that's how they started, but this has been now on the market for some time and it's wirelessly connected, you know, by Bluetooth and, and all of that. So we were able to then basically say in the hospital for two to four weeks, these patients are coming in, they're going to come in and we're going to give them these patches. And in this case, we actually asked them to self-apply these patches. And so that in itself is a bit of a challenge because these are sometimes sick patients, you know, and sometimes they don't feel that well and they don't necessarily want to change the patch because it's, it's applied every day. Um, but this is because we're in the research phase. You know, we couldn't actually have nurses, ask nurses to do it because that's for clinical care and this was for research. So that was how we went about this. And so we gave them these patches, ideally trying to go for you know, two to four weeks, the whole time that they're in the hospital. 
And the reason I'm saying that is to just allude to the fact that, of course, there's missing data. And, you know, that's, that's, that's normal. Um, uh, not desirable, but normal. And so we did that. We collected that data. But then the beauty of this was the nurses were also collecting the vital sign data. So we went into the EHR and pulled all that data, which is shown here in the sort of gold colored, you know, dots. And you can see it was more sparse than the temperature data. And then we also went into the EHR and pulled out the diagnoses and who got infection and when and who got cytokine release syndrome and, and when during the hospitalization, et cetera. And, and here's just some examples of some raw data plots. This is a CAR T patient. This is the HCT, a mean somatopoietic cell transplant or stem cell transplant patient. And you can just see here like 38 is in red, which is the fever threshold in, you know, the medical clinical fever threshold. And you can see all the data points and you can see there's noise. There's data that's, you know, really low here. Turns out that most of that data is because sometimes the patch will slip down. And, you know, if you don't reposition it, it's supposed to go under, under the armpit. Um, that will happen. And other times I don't show it here, but there's just missing data. So that's just stuff, you know, we, we, we have to deal with. Um, and then, so one of the things we did was we looked at the overall concordance, you know, of the, of this data to the clinical data by the nurses. And long story short is, you know, it's, it's quite well high in terms of concordance. It's, it's highly correlated. We didn't, this is more, uh, I think the Blen Altman analysis. So it's not really correlation, but it, it's, it's highly, highly concordant. There is a bit of a bias, I think, because we didn't filter any of this and because these lower data points. So on average, the data is about half a degree or so lower you know, in, um, in the, uh, sorry, at median 0.5 degrees or 0.4 degrees, actually in this case, lower in the, in the, in the continuous monitoring. So I'm going to just move forward here. So the first question, you know, was not one that required any fancy statistics or math at all, which was just, can you actually detect these fevers earlier? Because these patients are like amongst the most highly monitored non-intensive care unit type of patients. Because again, every four hours, nurses are in there round the clock, you know, waking them up, taking their vitals um, because they're at risk of getting really sick. And so we just wanted to see what if we had every two minute data, does it make a difference? And so I won't go into the details here, but you know, we, we came up with some definitions that working definitions of how do we define a, a fever event? Because you can, you know, oftentimes people get a fever, but then it stays high. Then a day later, there's more, Again, it's fever, like were they two different things? Were they one thing? We came up with some working definitions that, that made sense, at least clinically, to be able to identify these fever events. And then we said, okay, here's a bunch of separate fever events. For each event, you know, who, who found it uh, quicker? Was it the clinical standard of care or was it this device that patients self-applied? They didn't do it perfectly. A lot of times there was missing data and all of that. And these are the results here of, of the patients here. And if you go top to bottom in panel B here, right? So each one of these is a different fever event. HCT means it was a stem cell transplant patient number 12 here, CAR T patient number 20. And time zero here is actually when it was detected by the clinical standard of care, you know, nursing vitals. And if it's to the left of this, the graph, it says how much it was detected sooner by the continuous monitoring. And if it's to the right, it was detected like later by the continuous monitoring. And then the number of hours, you know, is, is shown here. And what you can see here is almost all of these cases, it was detected sooner by the continuous monitoring. The three cases where it was later, when we went back, it was actually missing data. The patch didn't connect well. There were some issues. And the other interesting thing, well, the other overall big picture on this, right, is for infections, actually. We also went in, into the records and said, what was this fever caused by? Was it by an infection? Was it by the cytokine release syndrome? Uh, or was it by, there are even other things like sometimes with a blood transfusion or there, there are other, other things that can cause fevers. And this was quite striking. It was 18 hours earlier. And that, that was striking to us from a very clinical standpoint because these patients are getting every four hour temperatures. So how are we picking this up 18 hours earlier, right? I mean, I'm not surprised. This is what we expected. Or, you know, this was our hypothesis, but I, I'm very excited because from a very practical sense, you know, we really believe that that can make a, a big, big difference, you know, for in terms of these outcomes of, of patients getting these infections. But then even for the cytokine release syndrome, which is a type of thing that happens super fast, like from the morning to the end of the day, patients can be looking great and then be like going to the ICU. 
you know, it looked like there was a four hour lead time. And then I'll just mention briefly that when we looked at the patterns of this, this is just very visual, right? Now we want to get more data and go back and really apply some, some more systematic, you know, learning techniques to this. Um, but we could see that there are actually two patterns. You know, one pattern was now in, in, um, in orange here is the standard of care fever. And okay, over here, this big line here. And what you see in this pattern is sometimes like a day before the temp track, uh, the, you know, the continuous monitoring found a little blip. It, it's almost like the body was trying to mount a fever. And then it actually came down. And I, I'm, I, my own speculation on this is that you know, counter regulatory feedback mechanisms come back in and they actually try to thermoregulate again back to a, you know, a baseline. But then if there's really something going on, like an infection eventually takes off again, at least that, that's my speculation. Um, but we saw this pattern that sometimes you would actually see this like more than a day before there's this kind of event. And then in other cases, we saw a different pattern, you know, where um, it's just that the fever became established very quickly. It's just that the continuous monitoring seemed to pick it up, you know, more sensitively than the, uh, than, than the standard of care. So the other thing now, that's what I think is, of course, the more, I mean, it's all exciting, but this is, this is definitely super interesting. I think from the prediction standpoint, the other question is, could we use high frequency, this we call HFTM, we call it high frequency temperature monitoring to actually predict the fever before it occurs. And this was again, good luck on our part and actually good, I think it was Sung who connected us, right? Sung and Srijan Sen who connected us to Danny's group. You know, um, uh, and the hypothesis here was, was actually related to circadian rhythm. And as I mentioned, like body temperature, even though it's tightly regulated within a person, between people it varies, but also within a person it varies according to the clock essentially, uh, according to the circadian clock. And, and, um, and, and again, in clinical medicine, that is not taken into account in terms of routine clinical medicine. Nobody says, well, you were 37.9 degrees, but you know, it was in the middle of the night. So that's when your body temperature is supposed to be lower so that we should count that as a fever. Like that's just not in, the, in, in that world right now. And Danny's group, you know, has been working on circadian models for like what, 20 plus years. And so uh, it was just very fortuitous that we were able to get together and, and um, uh, it, it, in this work that I'm showing you right now, uh, uh, Jonathan Tyler, a postdoc, and Caleb Mayer in, in, in Danny's group worked with a postdoc named Chris Flora in my group, and they got together to process this data and then apply these models that, that, that the circadian models they've come up with to essentially, um, for each patient, right, for each person, define a, 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 a mathematical model with with the right uh, uh, parameters that basically are fit to that person's baseline data before they get the fever. And then the question, and I'm gonna be oversimplifying again, that's why it's great, these guys are here. So if anybody has detailed questions, I'm sure they can answer them. But, um, but then the basic idea was, if you know that you've modeled this person's body temperature and this is the profile, can you then look at the actual data that actually comes in and see if it deviates from what that prediction is? And then that basically defines a circadian residual. And then you can also look at the average temperature and what you actually expect for this person's profile, see if that deviates. So that's a kind of a mean temperature residual. And putting those residuals together, they came up with a metric to be able to, um, to, actually, uh, uh, to actually look at this metric over time and, and what happens. And so I, I won't go into the details here. I think I sort of ex explained it, um, at least in, in high, high terms. Uh, we can come back to it if anybody has specific questions, but I'll just get to the punchline here. But using this approach and using this idea of difference in residual between what's predicted from the model and what's actually happening in individual patients, but here's the data from uh, in a number of different patients all put together, even though the modeling is done you know, at the individual level. Um, this is what they saw is that this difference in residual, you know, up before 12 hours is pretty much zero. So like there isn't really any de deviation, but then somewhere around 12 hours before, it seems to start deviating. And then the green is where is their statistical significance. The, the sample size was relatively small here. It was probably only about 20 or so fever events. But what is exciting 
to me is a couple of things. One is there was some evidence that there really is some signal there, right? And time zero is when the fever actually is happening, right? So all this is happening before the fever. And then of course, the other thing that's really exciting to me <laughs> is this graph that we had put in that, in that, um, in that, in that, in that perspective article, right? To me, like this right here is this transition state right here. At least that's what I, I hope we're, we're starting to get some sort of sense of. And um, it turns out that if you then analyze this by fever caused by infection, you know, it, it's, you know, this is sort of what you see. And I, I would sort of ignore some of the statistic and it will not ignore, but give it, take it with a grain of salt. I think the statistical significance, um, uh, uh, the specific timing of when that shows up, um, but at least closer to the fever, you know, it seems like there is signal. And of course there, there's, that signal is much closer to the actual time of fever only with the cytokine release syndrome, which as I told you, even clinically happens really quickly. So um, the bottom line here is that we could, we found that you can detect the fever early with this wearable device, right? To measure the temperature and that the computational analysis can identify at least a potential, there's some signal there, maybe three to eight hours before, but you know, that has to be kind of nailed down. And and this stuff actually got published with, again, with Chris and Jonathan as the co-first authors. If anybody's interested, you can go and look at that. And uh, the other thing I'll mention, so Dave Wook is here and, and he with Caleb and in, in, uh, in, uh, Danny's group are now actually working on the second generation kind of of this, which I think is even cooler. <laughs> so, I mean, this was cool, but I think is, 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 is moving things even, even further. So uh, definitely excited about this. And another reason, of course, the big picture reason why I'm excited about this is just the impact of this. And the first is this earlier detection of these fever related events. And we did all this work in these inpatients who are getting these very special therapies, but there's, you know, like hundreds, th hundreds of thousands of patients every year getting chemotherapy and every patient, almost every, most of the patients who get chemotherapy are at risk of neutropenia. So like they're essentially their neutrophils, their main line of defense, right? Of the immune system of the innate immune system essentially gets wiped out for a week or two, um, depending on, you know, what kind of chemotherapy they're getting. And they're at risk of, of these kinds of infections. So I think the, the, the real um, hope with this is that yes, it can maybe improve in hospital care, but this kind of thing, when it's done with patients at home, who get their chemotherapy and they get home, that it can actually pick up these infections sooner so they don't come in and get sepsis and die from that. It, it, you know, it's not a high rate of death. You know, it's probably, you know, a few percentage, but when you look at the total number of patients every year, you know, that, that, that's quite a bit. Um, and there can also be a lot of complications from getting sepsis. And I think the other exciting thing is, and I hope, and I know Danny's uh, hope has been this for forever, is that, there will be a circadian informed definition of fever perhaps going forth, you know, at some time, at some time. And, and then the other thing I want to mention, of course, you know, we want to add more data streams and get that kind of data. And, and, and I think that that's only going to improve, you know, what we're, what we're trying to do, at least in, in this particular case and other applications too. And so some of the next steps are, you know, further optimization. And, you know, Danny's group is, is working on that evaluation in larger data sets. We're working on, collecting more data, um, you know, looking at fever cause, can the pattern of the fever not just tell us there's fever, but this is infection and this is, you know, something else. Um, we've started to think about doing a clinical trial of if you actually incorporate this into patients who are going home after chemotherapy, can you actually improve their outcomes? Uh, and that's, that's sort of the outpatient stuff. And, and I'll tell you a little story actually about this, this this didn't employ the predictive monitoring, but one of the, the studies we did was with, again with, with Sung, she's a pediatric oncologist. So we started giving these patches out to patients, kids, you know, and, and their parents who were going home. And there were three cases in which uh, at home, the, the parent actually called the, the, you know, the person on call and said, you know, my kid had chemotherapy and, uh, this device is actually saying there's a fever. Um, what should I do? And then this was research only. So, you know, they were instructed at the hospital, this is research only, you know, this is not going to be used for clinical care. So the doctor on the phone says, well, why don't you take an oral temperature? 
So they take the temperature. In one case, they couldn't take the temperature because it was a baby and it was too fussy. In the other two cases, an adolescence, they took the temperature and they said, oh, temperature, oral temperature says everything's okay. It's not a fever. And so they were told like, well, just, just watch it. It's okay. We don't know. Then the night went, went past, you know, overnight. And then the morning, the parent calls again and says, I'm taking the oral temperature, but it's not giving me a fever. But this device is saying there's a fever. And so now they said, well, okay, since you're like super concerned about this, why don't you come in? And in both of those cases, they came in and this kid was basically on the verge of sepsis, had a low blood pressure, you know, had a serious infection. And because the kid came in, they got the antibiotics started much sooner than, than otherwise. And so I just mentioned that, like that, that, I don't know, sometimes, you know, this, this stuff we're doing, it, it, it can translate pretty, pretty quickly and, and, and pretty easily and, and with, with a lot of uh, meaning. I think in that particular case. So we actually did end up publishing that as a just as a case case series, um, you know, just because it's again like I it I boggles my mind, it, it boggles my mind and it doesn't boggle my mind because I know how the system works. I know all the you know there's good reasons for all the you know inefficiencies, but some inefficiencies there's not good reason for right. So it, it really I guess it motivates me in the end to see that there are some things that can that can change so profoundly. And so I will, uh, you know, just mention, actually, these are some of those things, right? We have to go through clinical validation. There's FDA stuff. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff that plays into this. And I'm happy to talk to people offline if anybody's interested in, in that kind of stuff. And I'd like to leave you with just one other little thing of probably just a couple of, a few slides. And this is about future possibilities. And certainly like today, we're totally interested in this and, and, and putting effort into like, can we expand this? Can we do more patients? Can we do more sensors? You know, go beyond infection and all other things. But where is this all going, right? And I just wanna share with you my own view of it, my own perception of, of the reality. And I think that early detection of various illnesses like infections and all that, that stuff's moving forward. It's gonna move forward, you know, just as a field. You know, how quickly it moved forward will depend on a lot of different factors. But there's also another elephant. Remember, I talked about the elephant in the room first, which is we have a reactive medical care system instead of proactive. But the other, another elephant in the room, in my view, um, is that even though a lot of our research when it comes to medical illness is really focused on the cellular biology, the molecular biology, the physiology, you know, the whatever, right? A lot of this disease that we're dealing with, especially in the US, I would say, you know, is related to health related behavior. It's related to, you know, I would say psychological distress, psychological differences in perception that ultimately, you know, affect the physiology. Um, and so I just leave you on this. You know, one of the things that I'm personally sort of seeing on the horizon and very hopeful for is that a combination of the wearable sensors, which allows us to get at the physiology, right? Along with a lot of mobile self-reporting that's now you know, a lot more easier essentially to do, could perhaps finally make a dent in this, in this axis here, which has been really stuck, I think, for a very long time. And I, I don't know, I'm not giving you many details about it, but, um, but you know, the, the, the big picture idea is, you know, at some point, could we get enough data on subjective states and link it to objective physiological states. So at some point, the physiology data can actually inform us about what's happening up here and in here, and, and ultimately uh, you know, use that to actually support the, the change in behavior, you know, which I think we're stuck as a society because you know, it's our brain. Our brain, you know, I think more and more neuroscience, as far as I can tell, you know, is identifying why behavioral change is so difficult. You know, we, we have a certain patterns of wiring essentially, you know, that, that, uh, that maybe these kind of devices could actually support in rewiring. So that, that's what I wanted to just say there. Um, Sung and I, and, and, and Danny actually, you know, we, we've worked on a project with students that's starting to take a very first step in that direction. And I'd just like to acknowledge, I think I've acknowledged, you know, a lot of the people, you know, already here. I also not like to, of course, acknowledge the patients and the families who participate in all of this and, 
and the Taubman Institute and, and, and two NIH training grants that, that supported this. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Yes. I this or not, but um, oh, for Zoom. Okay, all right. So, um, so I am excited about the circadian component to it, and I was wondering how many days of training data you need in order to get good predictions, and, yeah. and do the predictions get better if you have more training data? Like, if, if you had people start before they even came to the hospital, would that potentially make it so you could yeah. catch fever even faster? Yeah. So I'm going to answer it partly, and I'm going to turn it over to see if Daywook and, and Danny have something to add. So I know Jonathan and Chris, when they were lo, lo, and, and Caleb, when they were working on this, looked at like 48 to 72 hours was the amount of training data. Um, we don't know if you looked at it or more, so we don't know. We don't have that data. I mean, this was basically limited uh, to what we were doing. But I know now, Daywook, you you have been working on some methods that can use even less data. And the other thing I should just mention, which is I think really nice about the circadian approach is you can have a lot of missing data and still get a, a decent fit. And that that's actually really nice. But Daywook, do you want to add to that or Danny? Yeah. So for that work, uh, to, we need to fit the, some parameters for the model. So we use the first 24 hour data to fit this, uh, to estimate the circuit and rhythm in the body temperature. And then, yeah, using only using the, the 24 hour data, uh, we can predict the fever about six hour, right? Yes. Yeah, and another, uh, the future, currently we are working with, actually to use that method, uh, we have to uh, compare the free fever day data and fever day data. That means this is not a real time method. So to now we currently are developing a real time fever detection method. Uh, yeah, that's it. So we currently use the, some machine learning method and to train the, the machine, uh, we need uh, some like 24 hours data as well. Yeah, that's all. Just sort of following up on the self-reporting uh, uh, matter, how much of a learning curve do you think is required for the patients to be able to recognize what's what's deviant enough to report, uh, or if the pretty thing is pretty obvious? Or... Yeah, I think it's it's so context dependent, um, and I feel like it's the whole area is just in the nascency, right? So there's in the sociology world, like they've been doing this ecological momentary assessment, another I'd say fancy term for basically the same thing where randomly throughout the day, you're, you know, you query people and they with certain questions and so forth. So I, I think it totally depends on, on the context. You know, if it's a very specific thing, like I know people are doing this for smoking cessation, you know, so you're actually asking how, you know, on a scale of one to 10, right? What's your urge right now to smoke? When's the last time you smoked? I mean, but th that's could be a very, very focused thing, right? But if you're looking for other things like anxiety state, you know, that's one of the things with Sung, uh, you know, this this project in the student population, which we've been doing, it was just mood. And it was just a one question, you know, per day. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to answer the question because it's so, I think, depends on the particular context. For some contexts, there might be a huge learning curve. For other ones, it might be simple. And also, how much does it vary? How frequently do you have to sample, you know, to get something consistent? We don't know. But I think those are the kind of things that that are possible. And also, I feel like the technology for doing that is evolving. I've been in touch a bit with the information and school, school information, you know, investigators here. And, and even like, you know, like if you ask those queries from a smartwatch versus a smartphone, how much, how much more can you practically get, you know, per day and all of that? Sorry, I don't have a better answer, <laughs> except that it's early and I think exciting from that standpoint. Yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, my first is, so is like the best product for measuring body temperature on the market right now continuously that baby patch? Um, or was that just used because of ease or is that like genuinely the best thing that we have? Yeah, that's a great question. So we went through years of trying different temperature monitoring devices. And I would not, and so when we say best, um, I look at it as a composite best, right? So there's best 
technical best in terms of the analytical precision and sensitivity is the best. Other elements of technical best, right, is how much noisy data do you get? But then there's also another element, which is patient compliance, usability, consistency. And so we started out with this, this band that you would, uh, actually, no, it was not a, uh, there was a band that you had to wear, and then there was a sticker, and that was really good. Like, it's a really high quality data, but people would not wear this band for more than like, you know, half a day. <laughs> and later I found out the U.S. military was using the same thing and they're soldiers and they wouldn't wear that for more than like two days. So, so, so I would say, and then we worked with a startup company that had a very nice device, but you know, they end up running out of money. So we went through lots of different iterations. And I would say this is the best we could find that actually people would use and it was you know, user-friendly enough. Is it the best that's possible? I, I doubt it because I don't think anything is the best that's possible. Things are always evolving. But there's so many forces that go in, come into play. I mean, someone may have a better one, but then if they don't have a production and distribution and FDA approval path, you know, then that becomes less best. So I don't know, again, a complicated answer, for, <laughs> but that's where we're at. All right, yeah. Um, and then my other question was, um, I guess just more generally related to the wearable sensors, um, you know, for some of the stuff I'm thinking like particularly related to like sleep or maybe some of the more obscure um, types of things that you're trying to measure, like some of the accuracy of the data is a little bit sketchy or potentially a little bit qualitative. Um, you know, it's not necessarily there yet. Like, how do you see that impacting the role of research? Like, do you think it's valuable even if the data isn't yeah. quite as good as we might like? Yeah, no, I totally get the question. And and yes, I mean, I guess my answer is yes, it is valuable, but you know, it's always like both, right? So when I started out with this too, with the temperature, I was really concerned that we were getting this skin patch and it was not really estimating core body temperature and all of that. And even with sleep, you know, when we started out, you know, with some other studies, you know, neurologists were telling us like, there's no way, don't even think about sleep data. And it's still an issue, you know, in terms of like you're saying, especially for sub substaging, you know, different stages of sleep accurately and all of that. But I think with everything, it, it comes into context, it comes into the question you're asking, the number of patients, you know, the population size and all of that. So if you have a large population size, with some moderate quality data, right? And you're asking a question that can be answered with that quality data, you might be fine. Just like with our circadian, you know, the circadian modeling, our quality of data is great, but if we came up with a different question or a different approach we were trying to apply that required better data, it would fail. So I guess this is, it's partly philosophy. So my, my philosophy is that we don't know as much as we think we know a lot of times going into things, you know? I know I definitely don't. Sometimes I've been really naive and sometimes I've been thinking I know everything and I really don't. So I, I think it's this, you know, for certain questions, the data is crap and you can't answer those questions. For other questions, the data might be good enough, especially if you have a large enough sample size. The problem and the challenge I think is a lot of times you don't know that a priori going in and that's research. <laughs> In my in my view. All right, thank you. Hey, uh, your your point about how there needs to be like a fever definition for everybody on an individual basis that made me think of this uh, paper I read a long time ago where they were arguing that body temperature has changed over time since we first started measuring it. I think it went down, but I I don't quite remember. Um, do you know anything about that? I, saw, I think there was a lot of debate over whether it was like an artifact of like better measurementation mm. um, or whether or not this was like a real phenomenon. Um, so like, what, what do you think on like that debate? Yeah. And do you think these wearable sensors will maybe help us uncover why it happened, it, that's happened, if it is happening? Yeah. So I had not actually, I'm not familiar with that paper, but it would not surprise me that something like that could happen because in the end, you know, like I was showing that complex network of 
interactions that ultimately determine the temperature set point, right? Like there's still environmental input, right? That, that, that goes into that set point. And so to the extent that over the past hundred years, our environment has changed. I mean, environment can be physical environment, but it's also dietary changes, right? Obesity, I mean, you know, that, that's also our internal environment. You know, the inflammatory milieu of the body, if you just take obesity as an example, right, is very different now than it was a hundred years ago for the, you know, average person or typical average, whatever, typical person, model person. So it would not surprise me that that, that could change because it, it's a system and you have different parameters back then and like you tweak the knobs now because the environment has changed internal and external. And so the set point can change. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's changed like one degree, but you know, if it changed 0.1 degree or 0.2 degree, you know, a little bit, that wouldn't surprise me. It's kind of the same, you know, with the, you know, circadian parameters. I mean, these guys know more, but I would, I would about that, but I would imagine again, our environment has changed with light exposure and all of that. Right. So so if you, if you were to do some circadian measures, I mean, I assume you guys would agree, like you would say, oh, the circadian measures or things have changed, you know? Well, it's because now, you know, things are different, right? I mean, environment's different compared to pre-electricity, uh, essentially electric bulb or whatever. I don't know if you guys have anything to add, if you want to add to that or, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Monish? Yes. I was just Googling and, you know, I found some interesting things and I had remembered some of that stuff. So one post uh, talks about the body temperature of men uh, born in the early 1990s is on average 1.06 Fahrenheit degrees lower than men born in the early 1800s. And uh, there's more, you know, about women and, yeah. uh, you know, 0.58 and, you know, and it's saying that, uh, normal body temperature in both men and women have decreased donatonically by 0 0.03 degrees C per birth decade since the industrial revolution. So it's kind of interesting, you know? Yeah, that is super interesting. Because, you know, <laughs> that, that starts me thinking about the microbiome and, you know, the exactly. bugs we were exposed to back then compared because to Because that now. drives the rates of all those enzymatic re re reactions. I mean, yeah. you know, I can't, re I don't think you took my version of physical chemistry when you're a student here but you know i used to teach it as you know and you know those enzyme reactions go 10 yeah. degrees c 10 degrees is like 10x exactly so you could see you know enzyme enzyme reactions in the yeah. gut microbiome you can see all kinds of things changing oh for sure it's fascinating yeah it is any other questions well, if not, one, one thing I just wanted to say is a big takeaway from this talk, because, you know, I know not everybody in this room is into wearable sensors per se, but I assume you're into bioinformatics and data science, you know, in some way. Um, but the one thing I think I, I can, I would like to share with you, because I think there's probably not as many MD types or whatever in, in the audience is just, it's just that what you're doing, whether it's single cell genomics or it's, you know, a, uh, wearable devices or it's, you know, whatever, EHR data science or whatever. It, it sounds corny, but it, it really is important. That's all I can say. It really is important because nothing moves in medicine without, you know, all this kind of work. So, so anyway, so thank you. <laughs>